I've been exploring food for about a decade, since 2011, when I woke up to the globalized, industrialized food system and realized it was basically causing destruction to everything that I love, to people, to the planet, to other species. And the thing was, I realized it wasn't just the globalized, industrialized food system, but I was a part of that. Everything that I was eating was coming being shipped long distances across the world. It was in packages and plastic that was leaving trash behind for future generations. It was sprayed with pesticides. It was animals raised in horrible conditions. And I realized I was a part of all of that. And so that was back in 2011. And I decided I was gonna change my life to eat in a way that didn't consume the planet but actually helped the planet. And I had a big question very, from the very beginning, but it was a far off question. And that was, would it be possible to actually step away from this globalized industrialized food system? Would it be possible to step away from big ag and actually produce all of my own food? Could I grow and forage 100% of my food? So that's been a question for about eight years now. And about two years ago, I decided I was actually gonna find the answer to that question, and not just by looking on the internet, which I did and I couldn't find anyone doing it. I decided I was gonna find the answer by, by doing it and seeing if it was possible. Could I grow and forage everything that I eat for an entire year? Nothing packaged or processed, nothing shipped long distances, no pesticides, literally knowing every ingredient that I put in my body, including the medicine as well, my food being my medicine. And so that's why I ended up in Orlando, Florida. That's why I'm here today. I'm standing here because I finished the year two days ago. Today's the second day after growing and foraging 100% of my food. So proof that it is indeed possible. However, I'm the one standing up here tonight but I'm only proof that community can do this. There's no way that I could have done this without the people in this room, uh, Orlando Permaculture being a big part of it, but hundreds of people. It took hundreds of people to feed me, not by bringing my food to me or farming it for me, but through the knowledge, the education, uh, the spending time with people, getting plans from people. The only reason I'm able, I was able to do this is, is really because of the community. So. Um, so why Orlando? Why did I choose to live in Orlando? I was passing through here for the first time in 2016, I believe. I was invited to speak at East End Market, and I was uh, immediately connected with Orlando Permaculture and Fleet Farming. And my partner at the time, Cheryl and I, we just felt welcomed here. We'd been traveling all over, and we, we hadn't felt more welcomed than right here. And, we were telling people that we were kind of looking for a spot to possibly settle down and I had this project in mind and people said, yeah, come here. So, you know, we felt very welcomed. Um, but also, the thing that I liked about Orlando is there's actually a blossoming, there's, there's a community, but there's a blossoming community. So I wanted to be in a place where I could affect positive change. And but that didn't mean for me being in, say, Berkeley, California, where there's already a lot of change makers where I could make a difference, but there was already a lot going on, but not maybe like rural Alabama where people wouldn't really listen to me. Uh, Central Florida and Orlando is kind of this great middle ground right now where there's a lot of people, as you can see in this room, that really care about this, but yet we all know where we are. We're in Orlando, one, one extremely consumeristic city. So that was one of the reasons that I chose Orlando because I felt like it was the right place to make a difference. And then the other part is the year-round growing season. I thought, if I have a chance to do this, Orlando is a really good place to, to give it my first shot. And the reason why I wanted to do it in one of the easier places is because growing, going into this, I had next to no actual growing experience. So when I moved to Orlando, before this, I had only had a couple of small raised beds in, back in San Diego where I grew a little bit of greens, some herbs, and some tomatoes. And I just look back at that, and all the mistakes I was making were just crazy. I mean, there was a tomato hornworm, and I just thought it was so cute, and I loved it, that I just let it eat my tomatoes, my tomato plant. <laughs> and actually, tonight, I was going through my old photos to find photos to show you tonight. 
This is the, the small little greenhouse that I made when I first got here. And I look back and I know how little I know I knew then because there's no sunlight hitting this greenhouse. <laughs> this is under a balcony. <laughs> there's no way those plants would grow. So when I moved here, I didn't know how much uh, water to put on the, the seeds. I didn't know, you know how much sunlight a garden needed. I was just figuring out all of the most, the most basic things. And I was trying to do it quickly because I only had, uh, my plan was to have six months of getting here before I started my year of growing and foraging all of my food. But I had another big problem, and that was that I didn't own any land. I arrived here not only not really knowing how to grow food much, uh, but also not owning any land, and also not having a lot of experience in the state of Florida in general. I had been coming here since I was 16, um, fishing and things like that, but never had paid attention to the plants, and certainly had never grown any food here. So I was new to growing, I was especially new to Florida, and I arrived here with just a backpack, literally everything I owned in a fit, fit into a backpack, and a few connections. I had met Sarah right here at this church at a fleet farming uh, dinner when I passed through, and so when I got here, she was one of the first people that I talked to, and I said, hey Sarah, what would you think about me staying in your guest bedroom and turning your yard into a garden in exchange. And that's what I did. This is Sarah's front yard. Two years ago, this picture was taken. As you can see, Sarah's yard was grass, but she had a dream, and that dream was to turn it into an abundant garden. So this picture was taken about a month ago. And today, I actually had a really beautiful experience. I was standing right about where you see me now, and I realized I was way higher up than the land around me. So you can see where I am, and you can see the sidewalk, and you can see there's quite a bit of height there. And so what I started, do, I started doing is I dug down to see what was below me. Now, what it started with was sand. Most of you live around here, you know that we're basically a former beach, a former, former ocean under the water. And so starting with sand, I had to turn that into an, a garden, and two years later, I started to dig down today, and it was nothing, from, nothing but black, loamy so soil for about six to eight inches. And the reason I was standing that high is because that's all, that's all fertility that was created over the last two years. So I'm going to show you how I managed to turn front yards into gardens as one of the things today. Now, as far as preparation, the idea was that I was going to give myself six months to to prepare before I was gonna launch full into growing and foraging all of my food. And the reason I was so quick about it is because I've been a traveling person for really the last, well, kind of forever. Uh, I really, at least since 2011, I've never stayed in a place where I could really solidly grow food. And that was one of the reasons I didn't know the answer to that question, could I grow and forage all my food? Because when I lived in San Diego, I traveled six months of the year, and before that, I was consistently traveling. So I didn't think I'd want to stay here for too long, so that's why I gave myself six months to prepare, and then a year here, that'd be 18 months staying put, which would be the longest that I'd stayed put since I became unable to stay put, I suppose. So I gave myself six months, and I started just trying to figure things out. I connected with local resources. One of the first places I came, of course, was here to Orlando Permaculture. And I started to buy local seeds. I searched out local seed companies. I searched out local nurseries. I went to classes like Foraging with Green Dean and Andy Furk. Went to the local Earth Skills gathering. And just any opportunity I had, found local books, found websites like uh, Eat the Weeds and Survival Gardener and all of those. And, just tried to soak in as much knowledge as I could. It was basically my full-time job to try to figure out how to grow and forage all my food. This is just some of the beginning plants, just getting some trays and starting to plant seeds. And I just accumulated everything one little bit at a time. Some of the seeds were bought from companies in other parts of the United States, like Baker's Creek Seed Company, for example. Most of it was local. Some of it was Palmer's Dumpster, for example, just down the street here from here. That's where I got my sweet potato slips to start off with. And um, 
The six months turned into a little bit longer. It ended up being 10 months before I actually decided to get started. So, or to before I felt like I could actually get started. So grow food, not lawns, that's probably something that all, a saying that all of you have heard before, but that was really my, my core to being able to do this here. Being in the city of Orlando poses big challenges compared to being on, say, a farm, having that small space. So what I did is I met people in the community, and just like I did with Sarah, I turned six, I, well, not the whole yard, but I put six plots throughout this neighborhood, throughout the Audubon Park neighborhood where I grew my food. So I had that basically spread out in different areas. So this was the first uh, garden, and this is probably a month into the project. I can see I was a little fatter when I, you know, just before this year started, I lost a little bit of weight. Um, but the idea of growing food, not lawns, the, I like to keep things pretty simple. So I'm gonna share a little bit about how to turn your yard, yard into a garden. And for that, there's six basic ingredients. So cardboard, mulch, soil or compost, water, sun, and then plants. So the basics, the basics to turning a yard into a garden. First, you lay down cardboard. You can get cardboard for free from dumpsters, grocery stores, restaurants, liquor stores. If you go to appliance shops that sell things like refrigerators, your job will be a lot easier because they have huge pieces of cardboard. Take all the tape off, take the staples off, and you lay that down. The idea of that is to kill the grass. Every plant needs to photosynthesize, and if it has no sun, it can't create energy, and it will die over time. But that cardboard wouldn't stay put on its own. It's just the first ingredient. Over that, you lay mulch, and you lay about a foot of mulch. You can see the mulch here, and one of the big focuses of this is how can we utilize resources that would otherwise be completely wasted and do things in a very inexpensive way. So mulch is actually the waste product of tree trimming and tree cutting down companies. And a lot of the times they actually take that to the landfill. It's something they have to deal with. So instead you can get them to dump it into your yard. And you can do that through websites like getshipdrop.com and I'll have all the resources listed at the end as well. Or if you see one of those companies, you can just walk up to them in your neighborhood and say, hey, do you wanna dump that right on, uh, right on my front yard? So cardboard, mulch, the reason that you have mulch, many reasons, one, suppresses the grass to turn your yard into a garden. Mulch holds in moisture. So your lawn, if there's nothing there, what happens when it rains? Most of it runs right off into the street and you lose that opportunity. Mulch holds that in. The other thing mulch does is it breaks down over time into soil. Uh, it also creates an environment where microorganisms and mycorrhizal fungi can be, which are very important to plants. It prevents erosion and holds in nutrients. It has many, many functions. The third ingredient is, is, is compost or soil. If you're living in a place like Wisconsin, where I'm from, there's a lot of very rich soil, and that might not be needed, but if you have a sandy yard, you need to bring in some nutrients. So I got mushroom compost, which is a resource that we're blessed to have in Central Florida. It's a waste product of the mushrooms that you buy, or many of us buy at the grocery stores. So mushroom compost was my growing medium. And then sun, that's freely available to us, not much we have to do there. Water, also something that can be freely available to us from the sky. We live in a place where we, we get a good amount of water year round. Even our dry time of the year, we still get about three inches of rain per year. And if you're doing rainwater harvesting, you can capture a whole lot of that. And then the other ingredients uh, would be plants. So you can start from seeds, cuttings, and then buying potted plants already. There's probably some other ways to do it. I'm still kind of a rookie. I should say that from the beginning. Um, so that's the basic ingredients, and that's what I did to turn the front yards into gardens. So what were the guidelines for this project of growing and foraging all my food? So what that meant is obviously no grocery stores, no restaurants. That included my medicine, so no pharmacy. I had to grow or forage my own medicines as well. A lot of people 
know me for having done a lot of dumpster diving to raise awareness about food waste, and some people call that urban foraging, but for this project, that did not count as foraging. So the idea was I had already learned in the past that I could live solely off food from grocery store dumpsters, but I wanted to, again, step away from big ag and see if I could live independently of that, which would not mean eating those foods from dumpsters. So no dumpster diving, no drinks at a bar, no eating food from a friend's pantry, no going to my friend's food forests, because, I mean, let's face it, if I, if I ate at the food forest, life would just have been too easy, and I wouldn't have had to learn near as much, because this is Orlando permaculture. There's dozens of food forests that I could visit. So no food forests, literally had to grow or forage everything for the entire year. So this picture is on day one. That was November 11th, 2018. And you would think when I finally began that I would have maybe eaten quite a few meals that I had completely grown and foraged, but I had a lot going on and my first meal was the first meal that I had ever eaten 100% grown or foraged. So when I started on day one, I was definitely in on the deep end, jumping into the deep end. So where did I live during this time? Um, my goal was originally to live off the grid in the city and do all of this off the grid as well. But over time, I realized off the grid would have been a whole nother level of the challenge that I wasn't quite able to do. So I wasn't off the grid, but what I did is I built a tiny house homestead. You can see it in the back yard here. This is a drone shot. And here's another picture of it from closer up. And the idea was to try to live in a way where I was living as much as possible in harmony with the earth here in the city and in a way that caused as little harm on the, on the earth. I mean, it might not seem like it in the city of Orlando, but we are indeed in a natural environment of sorts. Even though there's concrete around, everywhere is nature. We are nature. So even being in the city of Orlando, my idea was to be as integrated as possible with the elements as I could, and to actually use resources as effectively and wisely as I could, and improve the quality of life around me. So at this tiny house, a couple of the key things for sustainable living, there was a compost, basic compost bin, which meant anything like food waste, yard waste, paper, uh, cardboard, all of that stuff could go right into the compost to build fertility for my gardens. There was rainwater harvesting, so my shower was a rainwater harvesting system, and that water that I used to shower, after it came off the roof from rain, after it cleaned me, it went on to bananas and then could grow bananas. The water from my kitchen was also from rainwater harvesting, and after I washed dishes and washed my hands and such, that went behind the sink, and that's called gray water, and back there I planted taro and turmeric. And so all of that was also used to grow food. And the idea of this is really to keep the water on the land. It's the opposite idea of a lot of today's society. You look at how the gutters and the downspots are set up. It's to send the water off of your property into the street and then into our stormwater runoff system. My goal was to try to keep as much of that water as on as possible still let it flow off like during hurricanes. I'm not talking about holding every ounce, but, um, but that was the idea there. And then as well as fertility, keeping all that fertility on the land. I also had a compost toilet as well so that I could use that. Um, so over this year, I grew and foraged 300 different foods. So I grew 100 different foods in my garden and 200 different foods that I foraged. And so... There's 365 days in a year. So what that means is that I foraged a new food for almost every single day of the entire year. So that's quite a bit of diversity. So uh, a lot of people you know, imagine that I would be just missing all the different tastes and flavors, but the reality is was that between the 300 different foods that I foraged, there was quite the diversity. So I'm gonna walk you through that tonight you know, a large part of tonight's focus is, is how you can do this. And not necessarily 100%, you know, that's obviously really extreme and very challenging. 
but how you can grow and forage or how you can produce as much as your food as you would like to. So I'm gonna go into detail with, with a lot of the, the actual plants. So one of the really important ones, you know, so many people dream of self-sufficiency. It's the dream of really millions of people to grow 100% of their food, to live off the land, to never have to take a trip to the grocery store. But you know, for most of us, that's really just a dream because the globalized food system is, is far too easy, far too far reaching, far too convenient and, and alluring. But even the people that are really largely living off the land, one of the biggest challenges is calories, actually growing all of your calories. So here in Florida, we're not, we're not in a grain state. You don't see big fields of wheat and corn and things like that here. So grains were not going to be the way that I was going to feed myself like billions of people around the world do. Tubers are actually what we have going for us in central Florida. So my first calorie crop is sweet potato. That's what I'm holding in my hand there. And some of the sweet potatoes were like what you'd see at the store, small ones. But the biggest sweet potato was over five pounds. So imagine if you buy a five pound bag of potatoes, one sweet potato can be that big or, or even larger. So in a small area, probably definitely smaller than this stage, I grew about 500 pounds of sweet potato. So it is truly one of those most powerful crops that we have available to us here in Central Florida. Not only can you eat the tubers, the potatoes themselves, but the greens are also edible. And what I was told is that sweet potatoes are the most useful land, uh, as far as any crop goes. You get more out of that per acre than any other crop that's grown because of the calories from the potato and then the nutrients from the greens. So it's really important to look at all of the elements in the plant because most people who bought sweet potatoes at the store have never eaten a sweet potato green, but it's a really, really useful resource. So sweet potatoes were one of my main crops, and then yucca is another one, also called cassava. Now, what you'll see tonight with a lot of the plants that I'm, that I'm gonna show you is that these are plants that most people in Caribbean cuisines and a lot of Central and South American cuisines, are these are staple crops to them. But if you go away from the South and to much of the United States, these are foods that, that most people have never heard of. But these are largely, many of these you'll see as staples in much of Central, Caribbean, and South America. Yucca being one of those, or, or uh, cassava. Now I'm just gonna say it's not yucca, that's Y-U-C-C-A, yucca is Y-U-C-A. And yucca is a desert plant that doesn't produce big tubers. Yucca is a plant that grows in semi-tropics and tropics that produces big tubers. So the nice thing about yucca is you can plant it along your fence line. You pr all you have to do for yucca is get a cutting, which is a stick. So like what I'm holding in my hand there, just a part of the stick, or all around this, this is the, the parts that I broke off that grows above the ground. Any one of those sticks, you just take that stick, you put it in the ground, and that's gonna turn into five pounds of yucca, or sometimes even 15 pounds of yucca. So this is what's called a survival crop. One billion people around the world depend on yucca, because, and, and the reason they depend on it is because it grows ridiculously easily, takes very few nutrients, and and doesn't need much water at all. So that makes it a, a very much a survival crop. The other great thing about it is you can leave it as your basic calorie bank in the ground. It can sit there for, it can sit there for years. At Peanut Butter Palace, there's one that was there long before I got there and it's still there today. And they can go down and dig that food out. So it's a, it's a survival crop. It's not the most nutritious. It doesn't have a lot of nutrients, but it has calories. It's twice as calorie dense as sweet potatoes. So very important crop. I got, my I got my nutrients elsewhere, and we'll go into that, but calories came from tubers. Now, another tuber is wild yam, or Dioscoria alata. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but it's an idea. I mostly use common names uh, rather than the genus and species, but wild yam, winged yam. This is actually formerly a dom domesticated yam that got into the wild. 
The largest one that I dug up this year was with James, and it was 157 pounds. I weigh 153 pounds. So a yam as heavy as me. And that's just one yam. Imagine how much you can, food you can get out of that. That's 35-pound bags of potatoes for one yam. So I found, uh, well, we found this wild yam in a, in a reserve about 10 miles west of here. But before I started, as I was preparing, I actually found a huge amount of it. There may be as much as 1,000 calories on the Katy Way Trail right over by the golf course, right? Growing right along the golf course. And that was actually on day one, I think, one of my first meals was the wild yams right there from, from the golf course. So an amazing plant. You can also grow it. There's a lot of people who grow it in Central Florida as well. So it's great for foraging for calories or growing your own calories. So another really important crop for me this year has been papaya. It's absolutely, for Central Florida, one of the plants that I would recommend the most. You can eat papaya green. If you've ever had Thai papaya salad, for example, that's green papaya. But there's so many ways you can prepare it. You can cut it up like potatoes and saute it. You can turn it into papaya kraut fermented, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So it's, it's not as dense in calories as the tubers, but still has quite a few calories. And as you can see from this one tree, I, I mean, I had probably five papaya trees, and I never ate 5% of the papayas that it put out. So papaya trees are a really, really worthwhile thing to grow. Another thing is seminal pumpkin. All of those pumpkins that you see right there came from the seeds of two pumpkins that I had for dinner. Before this project started, I was down at Sustainable Kashi and Sebastian, and we had a seminal pumpkin, and I said, can I take these seeds home? Just as excited as could be. I had you know, planted very few things in my life at that time. That was before it got started. And I took these seeds home and was just so excited to plant them. So those seeds, from two pumpkins turned into 169 pumpkins that I grew in two of the front yards. And those, the a beautiful thing about seminal pumpkins is they also store, even living, I lived basically outside, no air conditioning in my tiny house. It was, if it was 90 degrees outside, it was 90 degrees inside. And they lasted through an entire summer on my shelves. So they're truly amazing crop. Most of you don't have to worry about that because you have air conditioning. I've heard of them lasting even two years inside. So another amazing crop, similar to butternut squash in a way. It's got a bright fleshy, bright orange on the inside. But that for me was a big lesson in the power of the seed. Because just think about it. If there's, I don't know, 100, 150 people in this room, there's about 100 seeds in a pumpkin. So if we just had two pumpkins between this room, each one of us could take home one seed, turn that into say 10 pumpkins, and then that would already be in the tens of thousands of seeds, and you could, you could create food sovereignty so quickly just with growing our own seeds. It's truly amazing. If you order a pound bag of kale seeds, I looked at how many seeds are in there, and there's about 1.5 million. So one bag of kale seeds has enough seeds in it for the entire metro Orlando to have their own kale. The seed is an extremely, extremely powerful thing. Ron Finley, uh, he's a, he's a, he calls himself a gangster gardener out in LA. He's a friend of mine. And one of the things that he said the most that I absolutely love is growing your, food, growing your own food is like printing your own money. And it truly is. It's, you can literally create abundance out of almost nothing. It's, it's truly special. Another really important crop for this area is bananas. When I first got here, for some reason, I didn't believe that bananas would really produce. I looked around at all my friends' banana plants, and I just I never saw bananas. And I thought, that, I, I, I see these people growing banana plants, but I never actually see any bananas. But now, sure enough, the, the banana stand over at Sarah's has three racks. On, well, I just harvested one of the racks, and it already has, and it has two others, and we already harvested one. And I'm eating fresh bananas over from Lisa's house and fresh bananas over from Jen's house. So bananas really do grow extremely well here. And you can also forage them. Um, Dickinson Azalea Park has been one of my sources for wild foraged bananas. 
I've harvested bananas there multiple times. Apparently, nobody knows the stand is there because when I went away for the summer, um, there were five racks of bananas, and I thought, surely someone's going to harvest these while I'm gone. I came back, all five of them, I could tell, had rotted and not been harvested. So if you want wild bananas, Dickinson Azalea Park is a great place to search it out. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is. You'll just have to scout it out. But I found wild bananas growing within five miles of here in at least three different locations, public parks that you can go seek out. So bananas are a great crop for growing and foraging. Uh, you can wait till they're yellow and eat them as a delicious fruit. You can, when they're green, you can fry them and have fried green bananas. You can, you can blend, you can dry and blend the entire thing, the peel and the banana inside and make the green banana flower. So it is a, it's a really great crop for here. Now coconuts were one of the most important foods for this year. So I kind of shared some of my main ways of getting calories, which are just, you know, calories are the, the energy of life. Without having enough calories, we slowly would dwindle away. So it's one of the most important foundations. We can, we can be nutrient deficient for quite a while, but if we don't have enough calories, then we're in more trouble. So calories was kind of my big focus because I knew I could I knew I could make it through the year with, uh, you know, not getting enough nutrients, but if I didn't have, have enough calories, I knew I wouldn't be able to make it. So that was, that's why I started with calories. Um, coconuts are an interesting crop because they are very high in calories. They're also high in fat, and they also have protein. So the, the water inside of it is high in electrolytes, and it's often called nature's Gatorade. The meat itself is high in oil and fat, you can either dry it and, and shred it and use it as coconut shreds. You can dry it and just make chunks and have that as a snack. You can dry it and blend it and make your own coconut butter. Or you can dry it and then press it and make your own coconut oil. You can also make your own coconut milk just by blending it up and straining it. And then you have delicious high-fat coconut milk. So I've probably eaten 200 coconuts over the last year. And if I didn't have the coconuts, I don't know if I would have made it through this year. You can't grow coconuts in Orlando. They are more tropical. But you can forage coconuts all over South Florida. And all of these coconuts that are brown are mostly from picking up on the ground around coconut trees. They're growing in public parks. They're also growing in places like nurseries, people's backyards all over the place. So coconuts were one of my, my absolute most important crops of the year. Um, for protein, that was, you know, that was one of the biggest challenges of the project. Where would I get my protein? And probably one of the most commonly asked questions online. So I grew some of my own protein. These I'm standing with are called pigeon peas or gandules. And they were one of the most important crops of this year. Also very much a survival crop. Needs minimal nutrients, uh, minimal water, and it's a very nutrient-dense, calorie-dense, protein-dense plant. So behind me is the pigeon pea tree, and you can see the flowers there, and then those are dried pigeon peas. Just, you'd use them just like you would lentils or black-eyed peas or, or any dried bean, basically. So I grew some of my own protein. I tried growing uh, sunflower seeds for protein and didn't have much success with that because of the squirrels. I grew some, um, some peanuts, but also didn't have a lot of success with that. The other crop that I grew was southern peas. Um, so that was another crop. It's a ground cover that's really helpful in the garden and also a nitrogen fixer. So that was another important protein source. So other protein sources. Fish was always my, my main plan. I actually, if there's one thing I was experienced in and before this project, it was fishing. I started fishing when I was about eight, and it's actually been one of my biggest passions of my life. I, I truly love, it's one of my, my most important ways of really connecting with the land. I got away from it for a while because I was vegan for a while, and, and it, didn't, it just didn't sit right with me for a period of time. But for most of my life, I have been fishing, and I started fishing again about maybe three or four years ago. So my plan, my main my main plan was fish for fish was mullet. Probably most of the people in this room have not eaten mullet. It's not generally a really highly regarded fish. I would say one of the most important lessons as far as a food lesson that you could walk away with is that 
Most everything that is not highly regarded by American culture is an amazing food. <laughs> Other cultures, it's, it's the food of life if Americans don't like it, generally. So, it's, and with fish, you know, mullet is an amazing fish. It's very high in fat, the, the beneficial fats, and it's, it's very abundant still in Florida. The reason I wanted to focus on mullet is because it's very low on the food chain. It only eats plants, so it doesn't bioaccumulate. Bioaccumulation, what that, you all probably heard about how eagles uh, were affected by DDT in the past, and then their eggshells crumbled, and that made eagles almost, almost extinct in the United States. What that is is because there was uh, DDT, which built up in the fish, and eagles eat so many fish that it builds up in the cycle, and then once it gets up to the predator, so much of it is in them that it can affect them greatly. So what, what, what happens now is there's a lot of bioaccumulants. If you're eating game fish like tuna, for example, there's a lot of uh, accumulation of mercury in that. But the reason I chose, wanted to mostly eat mullet is because it only eats plants, so it doesn't accumulate by eating fish that eat smaller, that eat bigger fish and then bigger fish and bigger fish and so on. So um, mullet was one of my plans. This is a red fish here. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't actually catch enough mullet to have a really good picture or never got around to taking a good one. Mullet were harder than I expected. And interestingly enough, fishing was weirdly the most challenging thing. I could just never catch enough fish. Um, I ate squirrel, but not because I couldn't have enough fish, but because squirrels were eating my sunflowers. <laughs> and a lot of you are new to permaculture in this room tonight, but there's one common saying in permaculture, and that is the problem is the solution. How can you turn the problem into the solution? Well, here I was trying to grow a plant-based protein they were eating my plant-based protein, so I ate them instead. <laughs> Definitely caused a little controversy. <laughs> Some people like it, I guess. Um, I may as well answer the question, how does it taste? Eh, it it's just, you know, it tastes like meat. It tastes, it tastes similar to chicken, you know, not too different. Um, so, but I only ate about nine squirrels, so it was by no means my, we'll do questions at the end. It was, by, it was by no means, you know, a, ca a main source of food. Um, now, the other things, I thought about hunting wild boar. They're invasive, and this is not something that I did, so I can't speak of my experience, but there, I think, are, are a couple million wild boar in Florida, and it is one of the most sustainable ways to get protein, to get meat in Florida and other parts of southern United States. So they're highly invasive, and they destroy a lot of land, and they are an amazing resource that we can utilize. I didn't end up doing that, and the reason I didn't is because most people who hunt it, who offered to take me out, they bait it. And my rule was, I could only use food that I grew to catch other food. So I didn't have bait for the pigs, and that's why I never got around to actually doing that. And then the reason I didn't raise animals, you know, there's a lot, I'm not gonna get into raising animals today because I didn't do that, but chickens, quails, rabbits. Uh, you can also do aquaponics for fish. Tilapia is a common one. There's a lot of ways to raise animals. <clears throat> but the reason I didn't do that is, again, I would have to raise all of the food for them. So on a small plot, I didn't have <clears throat> the ability to grow all of the food for the chickens or to have any you know, grass-fed animals or anything like that. So that's why raising animals was out. Now, the other solution was number three, and that is car-killed animals. I, I haven't really hunted much, so my solution was to find animals that had already died. So David and I, uh, David Warfel, there he is, <laughs> him and I went up to Gainesville about New Year's-ish, searching for some deer, and uh, Joe Pierce helped us. He was going to help us out. We went up to, up to his place in, uh, near Gainesville. Uh, we found two, but they were too old. And so, you know, wasn't able to harvest those. And then it got a little hot. And as you can imagine, when it's 90 degrees by 9 in the morning in Florida, that's not the best time to be trying to harvest deer. 
So I didn't actually harvest any deer in Florida, but this summer I took a trip to Wisconsin. Um, I wanted to connect with my homeland. I felt a strong connection, a strong desire to learn the plants where I was from. And so I decided to take a trip up there. And I'll mention, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But one of my goals while I was there was to get a deer. Now, when I got to Wisconsin, I was really, I was really deficient in fat and protein. And I was like, this was something that I was really trying for. And it actually took me a whole month before I actually was able to get one. But by towards the end, I harvested five deer in Wisconsin. And that ended up being really one of my main sources of, you could say one of my main sources of food the entire year. It probably made up 10% plus of my food for the entire year. Um, OK, one of my other main sources of, a uh, really a main source of food was honey. So sugar is really important. I actually, uh, you know, one of the big challenges I thought of this year was going to be chocolate. That's actually one of my favorite foods in the whole world, dark chocolate. Um, my former partner, Cheryl, used to call me a chocolate vampire because if it was around me, I did bad things. Like, I would just eat everyone's share of chocolate and not be able to resist. Like, I loved it. So that was one of the big things. Could I get by without chocolate? Um, and so the solution was honey. And this year, I think I harvested five gallons of honeys, honey from my bees. So that is, you know, a lot of honey. That is about, let's see, a gallon is about 10 pounds. So that'd be, f no, that's not right. Anyway, five gallons. It's a huge amount of honey. It's one of those big blue jugs. So honey was a, a really important source of, of calories, of enjoyment. Uh, it added a lot of value to different meals. I fermented with it. Um, now, sugar cane is another source of sugar that you can do here. And that's something that, that actually is pretty easy. But it takes time, and it's just not one of the things that I ever did. I, plant, I actually got a whole bunch of sugar cane cuttings but they all rotted and I never got around to it. It's an important lesson when you're trying to grow and forage 100% of your food. It's not that necessarily any one thing is challenging, it's that trying to do everything is challenging. And that's like, you know, people would often say, well, why don't you just do that? Well, because I'm already working 70 hours a week on my food, so I just didn't have time to do that. So that's one of the big differences between shooting for 100% and say 80%. It's actually that last 20, 10 to 20%, making your own oils and the calories and all that, that, that is one of the most difficult parts. Whoops. So salt. When I, before I started this project, I was actually on a train in Germany, and I was just thinking, how the heck am I going to get salt? I've, you know, I never had seen anyone eating salt that they harvested, and I had very little experience with it whatsoever. The only really... There was a couple stories I had in mind. One was Gandhi's salt march, where he walked to the ocean and he picked up salt from the ocean and that was his protest against the British. And I knew that they literally just picked up salt. So I thought, okay, I know it can be done. And I knew there was the salt flats in Bolivia, uh, the, the salt flats of Oyuni. So I knew there was places, but I didn't think that was in Florida. I was pretty sure of that. So I didn't know how the heck I was gonna do salt. I was I was very, you know, lost, and so I did the research, and basically all you have to do is go to the ocean, scoop up some salt water, put it in a pot, turn on your stove, all the water will boil off, and then you're left with salt. It's just as, as simple as that. So there's, salt water is about 3.5% salt by volume. So a gallon of salt water gives you about a half cup of salt. So you know, that's a fair bit of salt. So if you do, if you go get five gallons, that could be all the salt that you need for an entire year. So we can be producing all of our own salt really, really quite easily. And the most sustainable way to do it is actually not to put it on your stove. You can just let that w evaporate. Use the sun, let it evaporate over time. And that's also, I, I would prefer to do that, but I always just boiled it. Usually I boiled it on, um, on wood, waste wood from the neighborhood, like heat-treated pallets that didn't have chemicals in them or wood from the trees in, in my neighborhood. Um, mushrooms were another really important so source of food for me. This is uh, Pete Canaris and I. This is uh, two different species or three different spe species of chanterelle mushrooms. 
So when I started uh, this, I don't, I had maybe foraged mushrooms one or two times. And I would say probably when people think about foraging, that's probably one of the things that scares them the most is mushrooms. And there's one way to never die or never get sick foraging. And that's only eat something if you're 100% sure what it is. You will never have problem foraging if you only eat things that you're 100% sure what they are. That's the number one rule of foraging. One way to do that is triple confirmation. So you don't take one person's word. You don't take from me tonight that chanterelles are edible. You first have three different good sources. You can decide whether I'm a good source or not and decide whether that's your, your first source. But three different good resources before you eat something from the wild. So triple confirmation. Um, so I probably foraged about 20 species of mushrooms between, Wisconsin, between here and then my trip to Wisconsin. In Florida, chanterelles are probably one of the, the more abundant and easier. It's one of the most beginner easy mushrooms to start with. So as I, you know, I said I was growing and foraging 100% of my own food, and that included my own medicine. So for the last year, nature was my garden, it was my pantry, and it was my pharmacy. So if I got sick this year, I could not take any medicine to get better. So that meant, first and foremost, I had to take care of my health, preventative health care. Today, with our modern health insurance, it's something like 75% of all of our doctor visits come down to what we eat, exercise, move, basic movement, and then our level of stress and anxiety. So 75% of our doctor visits can be taken care of through preventative health care. Just basic eating healthy, moving, and then, uh, and then living a life that's not so stressful and anxious. So for me, food was my medicine, and medicine was my food. There's really no clear difference between the two. They are all working together. Every green that I ate, every, every vegetable, every fruit, the, the meat that I ate, the fish, it all was my medicine. It's just like we need to take care of our plants to have healthy plants, and it's the exact same with, with us. If we're healthy, we're less likely to get sick. So a couple of my most important medicines were elderberry syrup, and that came from foraging elderberries, which are an amazingly abundant resource in central Florida, and then combining that with bees, with honey from my bees to make elderberry syrup. I would often put turmeric and ginger and sometimes fermented garlic in there. So I took elderberry syrup, a tablespoon of elderberry syrup, most every day of this entire year. It prevents cold and flu, or if you get cold or flu, you can use it to reduce it or take care of it. Uh, fire cider was another one of my important medicines, so I made vinegar from fruit. Apples is an apple cider vinegar, but you can make it from almost any fruit. Um, and then garlic, onion, horseradish, and red peppers, serrano peppers I put in there, and maybe another ingredient or two, and fermented over a period of a couple of months probably, and that was something that I took most days as well. So fire cider, turmeric, I grew my own turmeric. That's one of the easiest crops that you can grow in central Florida. It's like uh, 10 to $25 a pound for organic stuff at the grocery store, and it grows amazingly easily as well. Just go to the grocery store, buy some organic turmeric, put it in the ground, and then you can never have to buy it again. Simple as that. Ideally, you can source it locally, but if not, you can literally just get organic stuff from the grocery store and start growing your own. Um, garlic, I consider that a medicine as well. Reishi mushrooms are something that I foraged, another medicine. Herbal teas, plantago or broadleaf plantain, that to me is a medicine that very much calls to me. If I get stung my, by my bees, not my bees, I don't own them, but the bees that I steward, if they sting me, and I don't do anything, I swell up big. I should have put a picture on there, but a lot of you have probably seen my face after getting stung. I, I swell up. But if I take some honey and some dried plantago and I put it on there within about two minutes, I generally don't swell at all. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty amazing medicine, and it grows probably in most states of the United States. You can forage it, or you can grow it in the garden here in Florida. Um, so basically, food is 
food was my medicine and medicine was my food. Here I am with Jeff, that was early on collecting elderberries. This is out by Blanchard Park over towards Peanut Butter Palace. And uh, again, just an amazing resource that grows all over and you can grow it in your garden. So another one of those kind of borderline, food or medicine, is wild fermentation. It's one of the most important ways for me to stay healthy, to increase the nutrients in my diet, uh, and to have a, 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 a well-functioning digestive system. So I did a lot of wild fermentation. Now, what is wild fermentation? That is taking the yeast and the bacteria from the air and using that for fermentation. What wouldn't be wild fermentation would be a controlled, sterile environment where you buy a specific yeast, like baker's yeast, and you use that to make things bubble or raise. That's, is that even fermentation? Is that fermentation? Yeah? So that's fermentation, but not wild fermentation. That's a way that most of the beers you buy, for example, are done. So wild fermentation is literally just the yeast and the bacteria that are in every breath we take using that to ferment your food. And all you have to do to attract them is put food that they want there that they will eat. So bacteria and yeast love sugar. And again, it's, it's on every tiny part of our skin. It's in every breath we take. Every breath we take, we consume yeast and bacteria. So wild fermentation, some of the things that I have here, for example, this is uh, papaya kraut, so you know sauerkraut, but you can use the green papaya to make a delicious ferment. This is jun, jun is not gin, it's like kombucha, except it uses honey and green tea. And I gr you can grow green tea here as well, or yapon holly, and I'll tell you that in a bit. I'll tell you about that in a bit. So fruit scrap vinegar, most fruits, especially fruits that are high in sugar, you can make vinegar from. The rinds of pineapples have enough juices left on them still, and you can make vinegar just from the leftover pineapple scraps. Uh, honey wine, and another one is ginger beer or turmeric beer. That's not an alcohol, even though it's called beer, but that's another than one that I made. Um, so this is some of my sauerkrauts here, and the amazing thing, uh, I, what, what I did is, I, I didn't have a fridge and I didn't have air conditioning, so I needed to keep them cold. So what I did is I just built this little underground storage and it was an experiment. I, I didn't know if it would work. I knew it would at least be a little bit better probably. And the idea was to keep the things cooler because fermenting is done best in somewhere like the mid 70s, not 90 degrees. There's some fermenting that can be done at that, but sauerkraut and things like that are around 70 degrees. So hard to do in the summer, unless you're in air conditioning, then it doesn't matter. But so I had to figure out a way to keep things a little bit cooler. So I built this little underground, well actually my friend Harley built this, little underground storage container. And uh, the idea was at least maybe I'd get an extra month of life out of, out of the sauerkraut. Because it's not like I could go to the store and buy cabbage and I couldn't grow cabbage in the summer. I had to figure out a way to make it last. And that's how you make it last, through sauerkraut. And I, I went away, like I said, to Wisconsin for three months. And when I came back, I opened that thing up and I still had about three or four jars of sauerkraut in there. And I made them three months before I left. So this was six month old sauerkraut sitting in the ground in Florida, about 90 degrees every day for those six months. And when I opened that thing, I did not know, is this stuff still gonna be good? I opened it up, it looked good. I took the cap off, it smelled good. Just pulled the little top layer off, that's called the sacrificial leaf that you put on top. I bit it and it was some of the most delicious sauerkraut that I've ever made. So it was a really awesome little experience, a little experiment to see that you can do that here even in the heat of Florida. If you want to get into wild fermentation, my favorite book uh, is Wild Fermentation by Sandor Katz, also called Sandor Kraut. He's also named the Johnny Appleseed of Fermentation by Michael Pollan. Amazing book, highly recommend it. You'll learn what you need about need to know about wild fermentation. So a little bit about fruit foraging. Now, I didn't have the time to establish fruit trees. Most fruit trees take a, a bit of time to produce. A couple of years, avocados, for example, can take five plus years. So I wasn't able to grow most of my fruit. So foraging 
was my, was my key for, for most of my fruit. I mentioned I grew papayas and bananas, but for the most part, my fruit came from foraging. So some of the easiest to forage and easiest to grow fruits are uh, loquat, mulberry, Suriname cherry, banana, avocado, citrus, which would be grapefruit, lemon, oranges, passion fruit, which is not a tree, it's a vine, and I think I missed star fruit. So those are all fruits that I, well, the ones that I foraged a lot are loquat, mulberry, star fruit, Suriname cherry, banana, some avocado, citrus, but not passion fruit, I grew that. So those are, those are and those are also all fairly easy to grow, well, except citrus, because of citrus greening, but there's still a ton of citrus in existence, so there's a lot of it out there, even with that disease. Um, some more abundant foraging that I experienced were mango, prickly pear cactus, and white sapote were other great foraging that I had. And then a few mentions uh, as far as fruit trees, persimmon, cocoa plum, java plum, pond apple, sea grapes are all, are all fruits that I had pretty good success with. Now, there's hundreds, probably there's hundreds of fruits that grow in Florida, and there's different fruits that grow in northern Florida, central Florida, and south Florida. We actually have a pretty diverse state, uh, but those are just some of the fruits that I experienced. Now, I went to south Florida for my mangoes, and this is about a day of foraging down there for mangoes, and there's so many mangoes that people, it's a problem. What I would do for foraging for fruit is I would just ride my bike around or be in a car, depending on the situation. And if I saw a huge mango tree and there was just fruit falling to the ground in the road, I would just knock on the door and ask if I could harvest that fruit. And generally the answer was yes. Sometimes it was absolutely please, this stuff's rotting on the ground and causing me a trouble or falling onto my car. A lot of the times people wanted it to be taken. Um, so generally that was, you know, the, that was the response. So that was a form of urban foraging, and that was kind of one of the gray areas. A lot of it was abandoned lots. There's, there's fruit trees growing in abandoned lots, in the forests, uh, in public parks, which is all clear foraging. The stuff that was growing uh, over the street, you know, on someone's lawn, that was like kind of one of my gray areas as to whether I completely considered that foraging. Um, but but basically, that's it is what I considered foraging because a lot of those fruit trees, I basically tried to stick to all fruit trees that had pretty much naturalized, where nobody was taking care of them and they were just largely in existence. That kind of gray area of humanity, and ultimately, that was one of the big things for me is that this project was about stepping away from big ag, <clears throat> but it wasn't about stepping away from humanity, and it wasn't about stepping away from other people. And I realized that almost everything that I ate was affected by humans in one way or another. Most of the weeds that I was eating, a lot of them came from Europe 400 years ago from humans. So that was one of the interesting lessons is that wild and domesticated is, uh, you know, it's a gray area. So an important tool for fruit foraging is a fruit picker. I bought this at, for $40 at a hardware store and that allows you to reach way more fruit, fruit that often would go to waste because most people don't have a fruit picker and they just pick the lower stuff. So another thing that I would generally do is I would trick, often pick the higher up stuff that other people definitely wouldn't have gotten. Uh, so my, my meals were definitely not bland, eh, occasionally bland, but for the most part not bland. Grew lots of herbs and spices. So the ones I'm gonna list here are ones that I recommend for Central Florida that do grow well. So African blue basil, Cuban oregano, holy basil, garlic chives, green onion, mint, rosemary, lemongrass, Italian basil, Thai basil, popolo, which popped up in my garden and I had no clue what it was and it was this mystery. I don't know where it came from, but it's a great herb. Some people consider it close to cilantro. Uh, cilantro, dill, fennel, thyme, Oregano, curry leaf tree, garlic, sage, dill seeds, coriander. The dill seeds are dill. You let dill go to seed and you get dill seeds. And coriander is cilantro that goes to seed and then you get coriander. So those are just, those are just some of the herbs and spices that I grew this year. Um, and those are, I'm just featuring those ones as the highlights. I grew a lot of annual greens. So collards is my 
top recommendation as far as annual greens. So some of the ones I grew, collards, kale, arugula, Swiss chard, mustard greens, chicory, lettuce, cabbage, brassicas, that's the whole family of uh, broccoli and kale and, and collards and such. Asian greens like pak choy and tot soy do really well in this area. Nasturtium and amaranth would be a bunch of the annual greens that I grew. I really prefer perennial greens though. The thing about annuals, and for those of you who don't know what an annual is, that's a plant that generally produces about once and then dies. A good example of that is a carrot. You can't leave a carrot in the ground for more carrots to come. You gotta pull that carrot up after about 90 days and eat that carrot, otherwise you get no food. But perennials, they can be, some of them are three, four, five years. Rhubarb in the north generally lasts for 25 years. Oak trees can be hundreds of years old and those put out acorns, which are edible. Um, so so uh, perennials can produce for years, decades, or even over a century. And they're much more resource efficient, they're more time efficient, they consume a lot, they consume far fewer resources, and generally they add nutrition back to the soil. When you take out a plant from the soil, you're taking out nutrients. So perennials, by staying there, it's less disruption of the soil. That would be generally something that goes hand in hand with no-till gardening, for example. So the number one plant that I recommend in Central Florida, if everybody in this room just had one plant, it would be Moringa. It's also called the vitamin tree or the tree of life. And it's one of the most nutrient-dense plants on Earth. Another survival plant needs almost no water or irrigation, needs almost no nutrients. It's native to India from dry parts of India, and it's one of the most nutrient-dense dense plants on Earth. It's truly a miracle food. And if everybody had one of those plants, it could change the entire state of Florida. Very easy to grow. You can get it from a cutting, stick that cutting in the ground, or from seeds. So Moringa is my number one recommendation. Other ones are Katuk, that's what you see right here that, that I'm cutting. Uh, chaya is also considered a superfood that's been grown for thousands of years that dates back to, uh, I think, the Aztecs, the Mayans in Central and South America. Sweet potato greens, as I mentioned before. Yucca greens, or cassava, not only does it create a tuber, but you can also eat the greens. Just like chaya, they are high in cyanide, so they have to be cooked. But don't be scared, the fact that they have a poison in them. A lot of our foods are poisonous if not prepared correctly, or toxic might be a better word. So they just have to be boiled for, depending on who you talk to, three to 20 minutes. So you can you know, go with 20 minutes, whatever you want. Um, but so yucca greens, other ones, cranberry hibiscus, purslane is one of my favorite foods uh, on earth. And uh, it's a very nutrient dense, it's actually one of the few plants that are high in omegas. Uh, garden sorrel, again, plantago. Oak, uh, and then uh, perennial spinaches. We can grow a lot of different perennial spinaches here. So to name a few of them, Okinawa, Longevity, Suriname, Malabar, Brazilian. Those are just five of the perennial spinaches that we can grow here. Um, so foraging greens, this is right here on Bumby. And this is a plant that most people know, um, Biden's Alba or Spanish Needle. It's despised by many front lawn growers and gardeners as a weed, but it's actually nutritious and medicinal. It's one of the most highly regarded medicinal plants by uh, a lot of the local uh, holistic health pr practitioners. If you go to the Florida School of Holistic Living, uh, they're always talking about Biden's Alba. It's, a, it's important medicinal, but it's also just a great edible and very nutritious. So, this is it right here. It has these, these flowers with the yellow in the center and the white around it. You can eat the flowers. They make a nice salad garnish. Or you can eat the greens. So it's a, it's a beautiful food. And everywhere you go in the United States, most, most everywhere you go in the United States, there's going to be weeds that are edible, nutritious, and often medicinal greens. So to name some other great ones in the area, dollar weed is in most of your yards, probably. Go to cola, which is considered a brain food, a very important one. Bacopa, uh, oxalis, purslane, and then there's sea greens, like sea purslane and sea blight. 
and then Plantago, which that might be the third time I brought that plant up. I obviously like it quite a bit. One of the, the foods that I made was green juice. Um, that was a, a good staple this year. As far as water, when I went into this year, my hopes was to actually get all of my water foraged as well, which meant harvesting rainwater. But that was something that I quickly realized I wasn't going to do because I didn't want to have to carry around gallons of water everywhere I went. So at my tiny house, I harvested rainwater, put it through a filter. This is called a Berkey filter. And that purified it. And then that was my drinking water. So a majority of my water this year was foraged water. It was drinking water. But wherever I went, if I had to, I drank tap water as well. So some mentions of other plants. And this is getting close to the end of the plant section. So other things, carrots. I grew over 60 pounds of carrots this year. So that was an important food source. Beets. Uh, Tindora cucumber, which is a perennial cucumber that can grow year round. Uh, peppers grow really well in Central Florida. That's probably one of the easiest foods to start with. I grew serrano peppers and ghost peppers. Uh, Everglades tomatoes. It's hard to grow big tomatoes in Central Florida, but Everglades tomatoes grow really well. Daikon radish is, a, is an amazing one. You can make ferments from that. Uh, green tea this is, a, is a really great one that you can grow here. But there's something that I prefer that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, roselle or Jamaican sorrel. Amaranth grains. As far as grains, that was the one that I experimented with. And I did get two pounds of grains uh, full of rocks. So it never was uh, tasty. It was, it was actually probably worse eating it than not eating it. Um, <laughs> but amaranth grains is a, is a good potential. Uh, Green beans, yard-long beans are, are a rate, really great potential. I mean, that's a really great food to grow here. Cucumbers, I did well with annual cucumbers, but that one's not always easy. Uh, kohlrabi, celery, eggplant, and also just standard small potatoes uh, can do well as well. Some other important mentions for foraging, there's acorns. Uh, for much of humanity, many, people that existed, 50% of their calories came from acorns. We only exist today as humanity possibly because of the acorn. We might not exist without the acorn. It's one of the most important food sources on Earth. Oak is present, I think, on every continent except uh, Antarctica. So an extremely important food source and can still be used today. Here in Central Florida, you could get most of your calories from acorn if you wanted to take the time and energy to do that. Uh, hickory nuts are another, uh, they're a great nut. You can make nut milk. Sam Thayer is one of the, the great foragers. He's got two books that I recommend, three books. Um, Nature's Garden is one, of, is one of them. I can't think of the name of the other one that I read at the moment. Um, but hickory nuts, what he taught me to do is you smash the hickory, hickory nuts in the shell because they're like walnuts, but there's way more shell and not a lot of nuts, so it's very tedious to pull out. And if you are trying to grow and forage 100% of your food, you have to learn to use your time effectively. How you use your time effectively with hickory nuts is you smash them up, you throw them in a pot, you boil them, and then that makes hickory nut milk. And then you just strain it out, and it takes just minutes to make your own nut milk that's great, high in fats. Uh, and, and, a, and, a, and delicious. I put honey in it to make it a, a really nice drink. Uh, beautyberry is, is, a, is, a, is a native plant to Florida that grows all over. Great little snack. Smilax, also called uh, nature's asparagus or wild asparagus, I think. It's delicious, grows all over the place. Cattail, we could talk about cattail for hours. You can do cattail pollen. You can eat the roots, the rhizomes, the shoots. Um, when the tops are young, you can eat that like corn on the cob. You can eat most parts of that plant at different times of the year. Amazing plant. Uh, bitter melon. The, those are those weeds you see, those little orange melons that grow as weeds in the area. According to Green Dean, four of those little melons a day will give you all the lycopene you need, which I don't know everything about lycopene, but apparently it's an important thing. You don't eat the seed, you just suck the fruit off of it because the seed is toxic. Um, so you just suck the fruit right off of it. So that's an amazing weed that's great, grows right, right around us. Brazilian pepper is an invasive, but it makes a red peppercorn that you can use as a pepper substitute. I don't like it. 
I use it occasionally, but a lot of people like it. Uh, American Nightshade is a, is a really great forageable. And then th one of the big foraging ones for me this year that really deserves a whole section, but I put it in the honorable mentions, and that's Yapon Holly. It's North America's only native caffeinated plant, and it is an, um, a plant with amazing potential. It has the same abilities basically as green tea, the antioxidants in it, but it grows natively to Florida, needs no water, uh, and can be harvested wild or grown uh, on your property. It's often used as a nice landscaping plant, so you can forage it all over the city. Uh, and it's, it's got the same amount of caffeine as coffee, and it's related to yerba mate. So it's basically the yerba mate of North America. And then a couple of failures that I tried. I mentioned sunflowers, uh, which turned into squirrels magically. Peanuts, and my big goal was to grow my own peanut butter, grow my own coconut oil, or make my own coconut oil, and my honey, and just make, and spread that all over a banana, and that was like my dream of this year that never came true. Um, I did grow enough peanuts, but it was, but I harvested them within the last couple weeks, and uh, I was just too, too busy coasting into the finish line to try to make the peanut butter, so, and I didn't get around to it. Um, so peanuts were a, a minor failure. Um, and then sugarcane for sugar is a great resource that I have not uh, succeeded at. And then my big failure, one of my big failures of the year was coconut oil. Um, I thought that about six coconuts made a pint of coconut oil. And I thought at the beginning I was going to make a gallon of coconut oil and just be coasting through the year with coconut oil all I wanted. But I got four ounces of coconut oil. So I didn't have oil this whole year, which is definitely one of the big challenges. It was, it's, you know, definitely one of those, you, you know, you don't realize until you're literally trying to grow and forage everything, all the things that you eat, that you don't realize how much resources it takes and such. Um, so coconut oil was my holy grail that I ultimately failed at. What I learned is that it's more like 15 coconut oils to a pint is what I'm told. So instead, I just made my coconut milk, my coconut butter, my coconut curries, so I used a lot of coconuts, just didn't succeed with the coconut oil. Show you some of my meals. This is my little outdoor kitchen where I cooked. Um, these are a few meals here. I did eat very well, uh, very delicious foods. Up here is seminal pumpkin soup with a um, beet and cabbage sauerkraut as a garnish. This is pigeon peas with nasturtium leaves as a garnish and greens. This is seminal pumpkin roasted with uh, inside of a collard wrap. So those were some of my really nice meals. And the little bit of coconut oil I did have went on to these collard wraps with the seminal pumpkin, and that was like one of the best foods of the whole year. So good. Um, here's another. This was a very common meal. I probably ate six, 700 pounds of sweet potatoes this year, quite a bit of sweet potatoes. And I did different things, but the most common thing was just to mash them up and make mashed sweet potatoes. This is a bowl of mashed sweet potatoes with greens and pigeon peas. You can see behind me, behind the other me, uh, seminal pumpkins on the shelf. So that's how I stored them, just sitting there right on that shelf. Um, this is another common meal, yucca. And I just boiled the yucca. That, that was basically how I did it. I didn't actually have an oven to bake. so. That limited me. I would, when I went over to friends' houses, I would often use their oven, and it was really nice. Um, but this is yucca with fish on there. That's mullet, the white on top. Those are the little Everglades tomatoes, and then that is a sauerkraut garnish on top. So that's just an example of a few meals. I, I probably really subsisted on a couple dozen different meals, um, but my food did vary drastically throughout the year. So as I mentioned, I did take a trip to Wisconsin. I, when I got, I didn't make any videos while I was gone, and people commented on YouTube like, oh, we went to Wisconsin and ate pizza for the summer. But I, it was harder to be traveling. Imagine I had no garden. I went away for 82 days is what it ended up being. So I had no garden up there. So this was a whole new challenge of kind of taking it to the road. So before I left, I worked long hours, often until 2 in the morning, uh, preparing foods. I was, I was uh, making um, flowers from yucca and yam that Marabu Thomas taught me how to make. 
I was drying coconuts and making coconut shreds. I was making tons of moringa powder. I was dehydrating herbs. I was foraging. I dehydrated bananas and mangoes. And I left with 100,000 calories with me at least, which is at 2,000 calories a day, that's 50 days. So I was carrying a lot of food. I was carrying about a couple hundred pounds of food with me. Um, so I had a lot of food, but I really was dependent on foraging. I did a lot of fishing while I was up there. I mentioned the deer. While I was in Wisconsin, I learned and foraged 100 new plants. And um, a lot of people up north say you can only do this because you're in central Florida. So you are the beneficiaries of that comment. We are in a great place. Central Florida is one of the greatest growing climates in the United States, I would say. We have this beautiful thing where we can grow many plants of the north, but we can grow many plants of the tropics. We're in a sort of subtropical area, and we're on this border. We're in zone, what, 10A, 9B, 9? So I'm still kind of a rookie. Um, so it's 9? Nine? 9B. OK, so 9B is basically like on this edge where we can grow many things of the north, and we can grow many things of the south. So it's this beautiful area where there's an incredible amount of diversity and abundance. With that being said, I never felt abundance like I felt it up in Wisconsin. It was the most abundant place I've ever been on earth. Oh, I almost didn't come back. Actually, a lot of people thought I was never coming back, but I had things to take care of. So um, anyway, my trip to Wisconsin was great. I foraged 100 different foods while I was up there. Apples were one of the most important. I made applesauce. Uh, I made so much applesauce. In my hometown, off the top of my head right now, I could, I could name 50 public apple trees just in that area. So if you ever go to Ashland, Wisconsin, that's my hometown, go and gorge on apples. Um, so got to mention the toilet paper. I grew my own toilet paper. I haven't bought toilet paper for over five years. Um, and uh, this, this plant is called Plecranthus barbatus. That's the genus and species, also called blue spur flower. It grows in zones 8 to 10, so right where we are. Um, so this won't grow in the colder climates. Maybe it will as an annual, but this will grow year round. I put two sticks in the ground and I have never used more than 1% of my toilet paper stock. There's just two, two little sticks turned into, you know, infinite toilet paper for life. It's basically, it's the, it's the perennial toilet paper plant. Um, and the, I'm rubbing it on my face because it's actually softer than anything you'd buy at the store. It's in the mint family, so some people call me Captain Minty Bottom on YouTube now because of that. <laughs> it doesn't leave a minty, well, I, got, I wouldn't know, I guess, I've never, I, can't, I can't speak to that. Um, but I don't think it does. It produces beautiful flowers. Sometimes hummingbirds were hanging out with my toilet paper and bees. Um, and it actually makes a tea. You can eat this toilet paper as well. Uh, in Brazil, I know that it's used, I believe, for upset stomach and, and maybe some other things. I've made tea with it. Very bitter. Bitter is medicine. We have, in this society, bred bitterness out of the plants. What we do when we breed, breed bitterness out, we breed the nutrients out. Lettuce is the, one of the least nutrient-rich plants that you can possibly eat because it has almost no flavor. No flavor means very few nutrients, so keep that in mind. So highly bitter means generally medicinal. Um, and here's the toilet paper next to the compost toilet. This plant is truly miraculous. This, this toilet paper you can actually harvest from the plant and it stays soft. I've done it for up to a week, sitting on this little, sitting right next to the toilet. For a week it's still soft, it's very strong, doesn't break, and on a dewy morning it actually holds the moisture and turns into a wet wipe. So <laughs> it's, truly, it's truly a miraculous plant. And um, for people that live up north, the good news is toilet paper grows everywhere. There's lamb's ear up there. And imagine wiping your butt with a lamb's ear. I don't know if any of us have done that, but it probably would feel good. They're nice and soft. They make wool, which could be scratchier anyway. Um, so everywhere you go, there's a perennial toilet paper growing. But this is the best that I've seen on Earth. Okay, so one of the most common questions is pests. You know, what about pests? I am very, very proud to say that I, in this two years here, never applied a single pesticide, not even or an organic one like Bt or neem. Um, now, how, how did I deal with pests? It's not that I never had pests. This is my seminal pumpkin, and 
I know there's probably some beginner gardeners in the room, but you all probably know that's not what plants are supposed to look like. Towards the back, you can see leaves. All of this was leaves, but all of that was eaten by, I think they're called cucumber worms. So there's different names for them, but they eat um, squashes, cucumbers, and, and plants like that. And so they came in and just decimated this. And I wasn't paying attention, and they got so bad that they actually started to eat many of my pumpkins and actually infest the pumpkins. So I definitely dealt with pests this year. A lot of people say you can't grow food in central Florida. There's this idea that a lot of people have that this is a horrible, horrible place to grow food. But that's just not remotely the truth at all. What they're doing is they're trying to grow the wrong food in the wrong way. So when I got to, when I got here, what I didn't do was go to the grocery store and walk down the aisles and say, what do I want to eat? I didn't say, I like strawberries, I'm gonna go grow strawberries. Instead, I talked to all the locals and I said, what grows so ridiculously well and has so few pests that a fool could not possibly kill it? I said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grow what grows the easiest, has the fewest pests, and is also very, very nutrient dense or has a lot of calories. So that's what it was about. What, what's been proven time and time and time again by the locals? I didn't come here and I didn't reinvent anything. The only reason I'm standing here today after having grown and foraged 100% of my food is because this is all the knowledge that's in this room already and in other people in this community. All I did was take that knowledge, put it all together into one little package to have me standing here at the end of this year. So as far as pests goes, a few things. There was one garden that I constant that I worked with, and there was the person in the garden, and they I had 50, 60, 70 different species growing in this garden. And she would always tell me about the one or two plants that had pests on them. And it was a constant, oh, the, the pests are getting these plants. And so what I said is, oh, well, we have 68 other plants that don't have pests, so let's just eat those ones. So that's one of the most important elements of pests, diversity. If you have 100 species and the pests are getting 10, you still have 90 species to eat. So diversity is key. Monoculture is going to bring in pests. Polycultures are going to reduce pests. Imagine if you have a line of tomatoes and you get worms here. They just walk from tomato plant to tomato plant to tomato plant and they just eat themselves away. But if you have a tomato plant here and on the other side of the garden and in between that you've got basil and onions and such, the pests amazingly don't get to all of them. So diversity, spreading things out, intercropping or polyculture. Uh, one really important thing is that plants basically have immune systems. Healthy plants can defend themselves from pests. So you need healthy soil. You need the right amount of sun. If a plant doesn't have enough sun and it's in too much shade, that often is what will bring in the pests, like aphids, for example. If you see aphids, it's not, how do I get rid of these aphids? It's, what do I have to change foundationally to make healthy plants so that the aphids aren't there? So that means planting the right things, planting at the right time of year, planting in the right places using local knowledge, doing what's done, been done for decades, and there's many ways to get local knowledge, which is something that I'm gonna go into. So a little bit about my health. This is me uh, about eight months in, and I was feeling, at that point, I was not catching enough fish, and I was feeling pretty deficient. I didn't have enough fat, and I didn't have enough protein, and I'm, I'm pulling my cheeks there because I started to feel my body and I was like, man, I feel like my skin is really loose on my body. I was like, what happened? I feel like my fat's gone and my brain wasn't functioning as well. And I was like worried that I wasn't getting enough fats. And, um, and so there was a rough patch this summer. There were, there were a good number of times where I definitely thought about giving up. There's, I, I definitely wanna say this was extremely difficult. Like it's a dream because it's very, very difficult, not something that's easy to attain. And there were definitely many times where I wanted to give up. This was one of those times. I was, I was just feeling very gaunt and like I, I wasn't getting what I needed and I was pretty confident it was fat and it was protein. And how I got to Wisconsin was I caught a ride with, uh, with Jen, one of the Gardens for Single Moms recipients. She happened to be going to Chicago two days before I was trying to go to Chicago, so I 
drove up there with her. I stayed in my aunt's 23rd story uh, apartment in Chicago and didn't have, and then that, it, it only got worse because I, I was sitting in a car, sitting in an apartment and mostly eating carbs and didn't have the, the fat. So anyway, that was like, that was a really hard time. I had my ups and downs, but that's when I caught fish. I had one of my lowest days. I caught a 20 pound lake trout and that would have fed me for a week, or sorry, three weeks at a pound a day. And it's one of the fattiest fish there was. Basically, it was exactly what I needed. And I put it back in the water because it was too big. At that point, lake trout are all female and they're, they're the producers for, the, for that population. They produce so much. And so here I had exactly what I needed and what I was craving. But I just couldn't eat it. I, you know, I put it back. I put it back in the water, and that hurt me for days. But I did rebound. I caught enough fish. I got the venison, and then at the at the end of my time in Wisconsin, I actually spoke at UW La Crosse, where I went to college, and they happened to have um, they had a dunk tank where I could get my body fat composition, and I got it, and it was 15 percent. So. I had built my fat back up, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I gained it back. So 15% is healthy fat, more than you know, I would expect on myself. Um, and I maintained my weight. I started at 153.4 pounds. And yesterday, uh, the night before I finished, on day 365, I weighed 155 pounds. And the morning of my first day finishing, I weighed 152.8. So 0.8 pounds less. It's amazing. I've weighed myself a lot, and you start to realize how much your weight can fluctuate. It fluctuates by about seven pounds a day. Uh, you can pee out a gallon of water per day, and that's 8.8 .8 pounds. So you're shedding a lot of weight just in one day through fluids and food. Um, so basically, I, I stayed, my, my weight stayed about as steady as I could possibly imagine, and I didn't get sick once. So uh, I think it's safe to say that um, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> huh. And uh, I mean, I've been doing it for a while now, so it almost, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little nonchalant about it because it kind of just feels like, yeah, I did it. But, it, but it, I, it doesn't lose, I don't lose the, the, you know, it's something that I was set out to do forever. So, um, okay, so I want to uh, end by sharing a whole bunch of resources, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, so I'm going to go through a bunch of resources. Now, I have all of this information online at robgreenfield.tv slash grow. Everything, most of the things, many of the things that I talked about tonight but certainly all of these resources are listed on that page, so you don't have to cram it all down. And this talk is being recorded. Have these cameras been going this whole time? All right, so this talk is being recorded and will be on my YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com slash Rob Greenfield. So you can watch this, and I'll have all the links in the description there. So all this information, I, I designed this so that it will live, so that you can continue getting from it. You don't have to suck all this in in one night. So I'm going to go through these resources. First, events, classes, groups. The most important thing is community. As I said, the only reason I'm standing here today, period, is because of community. I could not have done this alone, not even remotely. It's all through community. And the idea of this isn't that any of us have to grow and forage of our, our own food. We have an amazing community right here where we can share, we can trade, we can ask each other what we need, and that doesn't have to stop with just food. If you look at this room, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have teachers, we have permaculturists and growers. We have most things in here, and we can exchange those things and improve our communities without having to ship our money to these corporations in far off places. So starting with community, that's where I'm going to start. So Orlando Permaculture, where we're standing right now, definitely my favorite community in Central Florida. That's why I came to Orlando, because of Orlando Permaculture. Foraging, Green Dean, one of the greatest foragers in the United States. He's got the most watched foraging YouTube channel, and he does classes in Orlando at least once a month and all over the state of Florida. We have an amazing resource with Green Dean. Andy Furk, another amazing forager. Definitely, 
I have to say, my favorite human being that I met in the state of Florida, if you get a chance to hang out with Andy Frick and do one of his classes, it's social activism and plants all in one. It's, it's, it's amazing. And then John Martin is now an expert mon um, uh, mushroom guy, fungi John. Where's John? I know he's here. There's John over there. So, yeah, we'll give him a round of applause. <laughs> So when I got here, John wasn't teaching classes yet, and this is something he started doing within the last year. He's one of the mushroom experts of the area. He teaches classes. Uh, so Fungi John. Um, other resources, UF IFAS Extension. That is an amazing resource. I got so much through them. Um, they have a master gardening program, which is a great resource. Central Florida Fruit Society, that's where I learned so much of what I needed to know about what fruit trees to plant for my community fruit trees program. Um, they have monthly meetups. Per so some, e some bigger events, there's the permaculture convergences, there's local ones, and then there's the statewide ones, and those are an amazing place to meet local permaculturists. Earth skills gatherings are truly amazing. Uh, I went to the, that both, both years I was here, highly recommend it. The Florida School of Holistic Living is all about holistic medicine and holistic health. Highly recommend getting involved with that. They have the Florida Herbal Conference once per year. And then Sustainable Kashi is a place where I've done a lot of my learning. They have free permaculture classes on Wednesdays and there's lots of events. Uh, John just hosted a mushroom foraging class there a couple weeks back, for example. Um, so lots of opportunities there. So, and I haven't named all of them but that is some of the amazing resources that we have locally. Some online resources, one of my favorite is Pete Canaris. I was lucky enough to get to spend a lot of my time. He is one of the reasons I'm still standing. He took me out fishing and he was a, a, a great, he's just an amazing friend and an amazing resource. His YouTube channel is Green Dreams Florida. So much knowledge on there. Uh, again, UF IFAS Extension is a great online resource. Green Dean, eattheweeds.com. David the Good, the survival gardener, so much education came from him. Andy Firk, I've mentioned him. Uh, again, my website is robgreenfield.tv slash growflorida, or just slash grow, and that is just an accumulation of all of this put into one place for you. And then another one is uh, Terry Meir. His is terrymeir.com slash resources, and that is just a really great resource guide that puts together a lot of the events and the, the groups and such. So some nurseries, my favorite probably is Heart, Josh Jameson. He is one of the amazing, you know, solid foundations of this community. Definitely go take a tour there. And their plants are one of the most affordable because their mission isn't to make money. Their mission is to spread plants and plant knowledge. So Heart Village Nursery, uh, Echo Global Farm, that's down in South Florida. I actually never made it there, but it is an amazing resource. Uh, a Natural Farm and Education Center, that's an amazing resource for fruit trees. That's where I got a majority of my fruit trees for this year. Um, South Seminole Farms and Nursery, Greens Nursery, Green Dreams, uh, Pete Canaris also has a nursery uh, over by Tampa. But you don't have to buy plants. The amazing thing about plants is they reproduce on their own. So are there plants back there right now, or are those flowers? So we do have a plant raffle tonight. So every month, every month there's a plant raffle, right? So every month that you come here, you can take plants home with you. So there's plant swaps, there's plant raffles, but it's just about connecting. I have this, you have that. So you don't have to buy plants. I have enough yucca cuttings for everyone in this room. Unfortunately, I don't have them with me, but that all came from a few cuttings in the first place. Um, so. Simple Living Institute has had plants. They, they do plants, Orlando Permaculture. Lou Gardens has a plant sale. And then just meeting permaculturists. Talk to people. Ask if you can go over to their garden and share knowledge. Now, the key to a permaculturist's heart is helping them, doing work. That's the key to any gardener's heart, doing some work and helping them, whatever that is, weeding, shoveling, putting down compost. It's usually the, the, the labor that's needed because gardening takes work. So... Earn some plants by putting in time uh, at, a, at, a, at a garden or at a permaculturist food forest. Another nursery that I visited is so exotic, and that, that was a really great nursery about an hour south of here. 
Local seeds, when I got here, I asked around, even Orlando Permaculture, and I said, where can I get local seeds? And they all said, there is no local seed company. And I said, no way, there's got to be a local seed company. So I searched it out, and there I found three local seed companies. There's Crispy Farms and Apopka. They only have about 30 varieties of seeds, but they're all great varieties that grow really well here. Crispy Farms is, is an incredible little uh, place to get seeds. Whitwam Organics is over in Tampa. And then Southern Heritage Seed Collective, Melissa Desa is the seed genius of Central Florida, I would say. Uh, and they are a nonprofit, and they're spreading seeds. They probably have 50, 100 different varieties, and they grow all of them in Gainesville for the most part. So a couple local seeds, not local seeds, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, um, Johnny's Selected Seeds, Seed Savers Exchange, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, High Mowing Seeds, and Seeds of Change are all some great places that you can buy online. A couple of local books, my favorites listed here, uh, Robert Bowden's Florida Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, that's more annual based, but reading that really gives you the basic knowledge you need of understanding Central Florida. That was, you know, my holy grail of a book starting. But if it's not really perennials, it's more annuals. Perennials, David the Good was a great is a great resource with his books. Um, very small books that have the information you need, like how to create your own Florida food forest, and totally crazy easy Florida gardening, the plants that grow ridiculously well that you can't kill. Peggy Lance, Florida's Edible Wild Plants, is a foraging book that I really recommend. Um, Marabou Thomas has a more like a cookbook. Uh, home Garden Cuisine Toolkit for the Subtropics. Really highly recommend that book. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful one. Um, James Stevens, Vegetable Gardening in Florida. Uh, twice I have that one listed. Um, and this is Marabou right here. He's not here tonight because he's a genius who's at home always toiling away. I was lucky to get to go over to his house a couple times and he came over to mine and he taught me about yam flour and yucca flour and He's a genius. If you can tap into that knowledge, and one way to do that is through his book. This is him making, uh, we're making uh, tortillas without oil from flour that we made from my garden. And that's something he's been perfecting that I don't know a whole lot of people who do. Um, so that is an amazing book. Uh, his Instagram page is a really nice resource too. Um, some not local books. Um, there's so many books, but I'm just naming a few. Perennial Vegetables, and then also Paradise Lot by Eric Tonsmeyer. Um, Gaia's Garden, A Guide to Homescale Permaculture are two great permaculture books. There's so many out there, but just to name a couple. I love Michael Pollan. Uh, his books are some of the foundations to me questioning the globalized food system. So if you want to understand even big organic, Michael Pollan's books are fantastic. And then Sandor Katz, Wild Fermentation. It's not just a revolution of our food, it's really a revolution of our mind. He is an incredible author and person. Some garden resources, I mentioned mulch. You got your local tree companies and then getchipdrop.com. This is where you get the mulch. Compost, you get that from Monterey Mushroom or you can get it from the city. Our yard waste gets turned into compost. Oh, and we got the new compost program started by Charlie, so you can do that as well. Um, cardboard, again, again, grocery, liquor, appliance stores. Oh, if you want to do rainwater harvesting, just type rainwater harvesting into Craigslist and you'll be able to find barrels and totes and materials for that. And then drip irrigation, you can just get at hardware stores and online. So those are kind of my main ingredients besides the plants that I mentioned. Um, and then as far as this project, other resources, um, my YouTube channel is where I produced a lot of videos about this year, so if you want to learn more, you want to take tours of my garden, spend time virtually in the garden with me, because you won't be able to in real life, because I'm leaving in a few days. Um, but YouTube.com slash Rob Greenfield has these videos. I'm putting out a video soon that is how to turn your, garden, your, your lawn into a garden. Um, and then a lot of the resources for this project, if you go to robgreenfield.tv, um, slash Food Freedom Foods lists the 300 foods that I've foraged this year and grown with links to a lot of them. Um, slash Food Freedom Meals, that lists every meal for the last 365 days and every snack. Slash Food Freedom Photos is photos of many of my meals and my foods where you can learn more. Um, slash Food Freedom Rules is all the guidelines behind this year. Slash Food Freedom Why is uh, why I did this and more about that. 
And then lastly, the book. Uh, I do have a book, and one or not out yet. It'll come out December of 2020 with New Society Publishers. And 100% of the proceeds of that book are going to be are donated to nonprofits that are working on the food solutions, working to create more sustainable and just food, more sustainable and just uh, food system. So I'm not out to make money from food at all. Really, I think food is a, a basic human right. I want to empower others to grow their own food. And I, this book is, I'm writing it right now, and uh, I think it will be maybe the, the most powerful thing that I've ever put out. So highly recommend it. And I'll be on a book tour here when that book comes out end of December, or end of 2020 slash beginning of 2021, and I'll be doing a talk with that book as well. So as far as the media behind this, I want to thank Sierra Ford Photography, Sierra, my friend Sierra Ford. She took a lot of these photos, as well as De Danielle Werner at Live Wonderful Photography. And then as far as my videos that you've seen over the year, John Von Muschius, uh, Brandon Carey, and Paul O'Neill. So I want to thank them for that. But most importantly, I want to thank the Orlando permaculture community. I've said it a hundred times, but all of this is a matter of community, and it's been incredible to be here for the last two years. Uh, you made Orlando uh, a more than tolerable place, a beautiful place to spend the last two years, and uh, couldn't have done any of this without you. So thank you to Orlando permaculture. Thank you to Sarah Robinson for always hosting me in her house, in her church, wherever. I want to say thank you to Lisa Ray, who hosted me in her backyard, uh, and all of the fun stuff we went through, to, uh, you know, especially the team at Orlando Permaculture, Jeff and, and David and uh, Caitlin, uh, and uh, thank you all for that, and the whole Orlando Permaculture, and to Daniel for all the good times we had together and for the great kombucha. Um, and uh, the list could absolutely go on, but just thank you everyone so much for... Uh, being a part of this journey. So how long was that? How long was I talking? <laughs> Almost two hours? Oh my gosh, there was a lot of information to go through. What time is it? Nine o'clock, that's the longest talk of all time at Orlando Permaculture. I guess we don't really have time for questions then, right? Okay, well, I'll be around and uh, hugs, like I love hugs, so come give me a hug and uh, I love you all very much. And uh, next up, Jeff Trapani. I want to thank you so much, and uh, you've been such a great inspiration, motivation for us, and, and just helping us to get more um, publicity as well and get more people here and, and learning about things. So I want to thank you a lot, and I'm going to miss you, definitely. I'm just going to be thinking about you when I drive by the, the house and the property and everything, and just, but it's a great thing um, having you here.